Hello, and welcome to today's episode. Today, we are talking about Rock, Paper, Scissors. Rock, Paper, Scissors is a hand game originating from China. You've probably heard of it. It's usually played between two people. It involves usually a countdown. Usually people say Rock, Paper, Scissors. And then you make the shape of rock, paper, or scissors with your hand. Uh, and someone wins. Amazing. High skill, high stakes game. Well, hang on, hang on a what minute. What do you think about that? Hang on a minute. Who, who, who wins? How do you know who wins? I've never played this game before. <laughs> you've, you've never played this game no. before. How, how, how do you win? So you said wow. someone wins. I, here I was assuming that to any UK based listener, they would know this game, but <laughs> no, my expectations shattered immediately. <laughs> you know, because the same as all rock, paper, scissors based games, there's just a code, you know, so. Uh, hopefully, by looking at the article, you've seen what shape, what sh- what the shapes are, the hand gestures. Yes. You know, you've got a closed fist for rock. Yep. You've got the fingers for scissors and the flat hand for paper. Yeah. So it's a simple case of, it's a triangle, and each gesture gets beaten by one thing and beats another thing, and it goes like, it goes a little something like this. Uh, rock beats scissors. Scissors beats paper. Paper beats rock. It's sort of a, a little bit logical, you know. You can um, cut paper with scissors. With paper, you can cover up a rock. Mm-hmm. And with a rock, you can break some scissors. That makes a lot of sense to me. This is a very exciting topic of discussion. I mean, already, this podcast also serves as a tutorial for how to play this <laughs> ancient game. Yeah. Yeah, of course. We have hand games. Have you played? Have you played any other hand games? Um, I've made shadow puppets before, but I don't know if I'd call that a game. Um, I suppose that counts somewhat. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I don't, what hand game? What? I don't know if I if I play. A... What about the clapping game? I remember. I remember. I seem to recall. I can't remember whether this was like year seven or in in primary school. That I remember is very. There was a very popular game amongst the girls in particular to do this this game where you you sort of clap out a rhythm, uh, like you clap with a partner. So you clap your hands together and then you clap across, uh, and there was a, a some sort of rhyme going along with it. Oh yes, and you sped up. Until someone made a mistake, right? You repeated. Yeah. Yes, yes. Oh, then there's another hand game that I've played. Um, I don't know. It's, it probably has a name. I don't know what it's called. But you know where you hold your hands together sort of in front of your chest, like in a uh, in like a prayer motion, and you have you can sort of take turns attempting to slap the other person's hands. Oh, I think you have to point your fingers towards your opponent, yeah. and then you have to swing them up to dodge. <laughs> okay. Uh, I may have played this before. Um, it's kind of like a, a warm-up game in some sports, actually. Um, um, like contact sports. I've, I've played similar games with jiu-jitsu. Um, like, like, you have to touch the other person's knee. I don't know if that counts really as a hand game, but I digress. I'm very excited to talk about rock, paper, scissors. There's a lot I didn't know, actually. Um, I was telling a white lie before. I have, in fact, played the game before. (laughs) But um, I didn't know its origins. I didn't know that it went by other names. I didn't know any of the variants. Um, uh, I didn't know the psychological, very important that can go into playing rock paper scissors i didn't know that uh there are entire rock paper scissor uh competitions that are held across the planet and have been for many years now um overall i learned a lot reading this article and it was definitely worthy of the featured status um where 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 do you think we uh, we should begin 
Well, uh, I was just interested in how many sub-genres of hand games there are. <laughs> I was just having a look. <laughs> There's quite a long list of of pages, and they're not necessarily for very for specific games. Some of them are for, for example, clapping games, and it looks like a lot of the clapping games um, are based upon rhymes. Like they've all got names put here in, in inverted commas, ah. and they're they're like nursery rhymes with a with a sort of clapping pattern going on. You've, you've, I digress. You've gone down a rabbit hole, as we are often want to do on Wikipedia. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, it's what's so useful about hyperlinks. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, did you know that the game originated in China? I, I did not know that. I didn't know anything about the origin of the game. Mm. Um. It says that the first known mention of the game was in a book written during the Ming uh, dynasty um, who wrote that the game dated back to the time of the Han dynasty. So the Ming dynasty would uh, was during what in Europe would be called the um, late Middle Ages to the early Renaissance and the book was written around 1600 AD but the Han Dynasty was considerably earlier um, and uh, according to this book uh, written by uh, Xie Jiaozhi um, it was invented um, around 200 uh, BC to 200 AD so the game is at least uh, 400 years old and possibly 2,000 years old um, but it only came to um, the West or at least the United States I'm not so sure about Europe it doesn't discuss that particularly in the 20th century in all likelihood its origins there are a bit more obscure with conflictual accounts and uh, contradictory evidence for how well known it was and exactly when it was introduced and when it was popularized but um, it's actually a very very recent game played in, uh, in in at least the US if you went back to the Revolutionary War um, and you said hey let's play rock paper scissors they would look at you and be like what are you talking about? <laughs> yes, well, even later on, uh, it's been known as Rochambeau in the Western United States, hasn't it? Yes, I didn't know that either, although I did kind of recognise the name Rochambeau. I had heard that name before, but I hadn't connected it to... Um, rock paper scissors also it doesn't seem especially clear why that became the name there's a a brief reference saying that it Rochambeau could sound a little like one of the names for it in another language uh, but Rochambeau the fact that it is referred to as that has caused it to be associated with the historical figure Count Rochambeau and it's now a legend that he played the game during the Revolutionary War although there does not seem to be any evidence that that's the case and it seems to be the case that the game only really came to the US in the 1930s mm. and uh, for those of you who are interested Rochambeau's full name was uh, Jean-Baptiste Donatien de Vimeur, Comte de Rochambeau, who was uh, a French general who played the decisive role in helping the United States defeat the British army at the Battle of Yorktown in 1781, which uh, concluded the American Revolution. Um, there are also different variants of rock, paper, scissors. Um, some variants are the same game essentially but 
rename what you label the hand gestures. Some variants uh, additionally change the hand gestures. The uh, earliest Japanese game from um, called uh, uh, Sancho Kumiken, I think, um, used the pinky finger for slug, uh, the thumb for frog, and the index finger for snake. Um, and I think it was that the uh, was it slug slug beats snake which beats frog which beats slug um <laughs> not quite sure uh yes uh yes frog tri uh, frog triumphs over slug and uh, slug prevails over snake and snake triumphs over frog um or the uh, Kitsune, which is a, a supernatural fox in Japanese mythology, uh, versus um, uh, defeats village leader, village leader defeats hunter, and hunter defeats uh, Kitsune. Uh, gestures. But there are some variants that use five gestures, and it's not a cycle, but each gesture has two that it beats and therefore two that it loses to and so on and so forth. Do you have a, a preference for what variant of rock, paper, scissors you will be playing going forward? I mean, for practical purposes, I'll probably stick with the default rock, paper, scissors. <laughs> Although I was familiar with the with the classic pop culture Rock, Paper, Scissors, Lizard, Spock which is uh, a version that includes clearly two extras Spock and Lizard where Spock can smash scissors and vaporise the rock but he's poisoned by the lizard and disproved by paper <laughs> and lizard <laughs> and lizard poisons Spock and eats paper so it is crushed by rock and decapitated by scissors. Really, in the meta narrative of that encyclopedia podcast, we're learning quite a lot about Spock. That he can be poisoned by lizards, his intelligence can be defeated by paper, and that he is a Christ like figure <laughs> in literary <laughs> fiction. Yeah, so it seems to have come about a while ago, this version, but I know that the knowledge of this variant has become more widespread thanks to the Big Bang Theory by uh, by featuring in an episode. Big Bang Theory being a very famous American sitcom to anyone that didn't know already. Mm. Um, and uh, if you follow this uh, this uh, sequence where any variation of rock, paper, scissors is an oriented graph then uh, according to theoretical calculations, the number of distinguishable oriented graphs, each of which is a potentially playable rock-paper-scissors game, grows with the number of weapons, 3, 4, 5, uh, in the sequence 7, 42, 582, 6 leads to over 21,000, 7 gets you over 2 million, uh, 8 gets you over half a billion, and then 9 gets you almost halfway to a trillion. So it becomes very big very quickly. Um, so I think your inclination to stick with the simple well-known variant is uh, admirable. <laughs> though, that, <laughs> though that said, there are still important questions to be considered, even with the basic rock, paper, scissors uh, that we all know and love. For example, do you throw your hand gesture on scissors or do you throw one beat after scissors. Do you go on three or four? Uh, I'm familiar with going on scissors, personally. That's interesting. Get the game over nice and snappy. Yeah. See, I prefer going on four. But... Well, that's just going to make... If we were ever played, that would just be a really awkward game. Well, <laughs> yeah, well, I've, I've, I've played some awkward games like that. 
um, and you have to kind of reset. But I, I think that if you go on one of the, uh, whilst naming one of the options, it influences your probability of selecting that option. I don't know if that's true, but it feels like it should be true. <laughs> Um, are you more likely to throw scissors if you go on scissors than if you wait one beat? The psychology behind rock, paper, scissors is mm. quite... Um, there's more well, research than surely we could, we could look up what the, uh, the normal outcomes are, and if people, norm if people play the game either after scissors or on scissors, then let's say we'd expect it to mostly be scissors. <laughs> I know that I'm, I'm going to Google this. <laughs> well, while you're Googling, I can share that uh, there is a tendency for people to default to rock in general as a rule of thumb uh, because your hand gesture while counting to the throw is a closed fist, which is identical to the rock shape. And so people are more inclined to, especially if they're rushed or they feel under pressure, freeze and keep their hand the same and just go with rock which means that on average if you choose paper you win unless you know that you're playing with someone who listens to the podcast and this episode specifically in which case you should now throw scissors because they will throw paper mm. i'm just looking at i've already found something and it seems there may be some psychology going on, but it may be the opposite. Really? Because scissors... So, psychology today and the Rock Paper Scissors Association <laughs> both claim that some moves are favoured and report that... So it's about 35% of the time Rock is played, about 35% of the time Paper is played, and Scissors is played the least. Really? 30%. So that means if Scissors is played the least, then that means Rock is the least useful to throw. So Paper is the meta game. Yes. And that, that concurs with people kind of throwing Rock uh, and therefore defaulting to Paper, if you know that. So we're, we're, we've reached the same conclusion through two different avenues. This is good. Play Paper. Mm -hmm. Meta game is clear. <laughs> Did you know that rock paper scissors has been used in official um, legal proceedings on at least two occasions? Well, one occasion plus uh, some other tidbits. I did actually, mm. but you can remind me. <laughs> there was a. Uh, court case in the United States in 2006. Um, get this here. Yes, the American court case. 2006, uh, an American federal judge, Gregory Presnell, from uh, the Middle District of Florida, ordered opposing sides in a lengthy court case to settle a trivial but lengthily debated point over the appropriate place for a deposition using the game of rock, paper, scissors. And although that's in plain speak all that happened uh, that's relevant to this particular episode, I was, I won't read it all out, it will take a while, particularly pleased uh, by the sheer length of the paragraph that follows, which quotes the um, wording of the ruling in Avista Management versus WowSow Underwriters, uh, which is a, like, eight-line paragraph on a widescreen computer uh, specifying the time and place that rock, paper, scissors should be played, a backup location in case uh, uh, an agreement can't be reached, um, who is allowed to attend and witness the game, um, why the game's being played. It's, it's a whole ordeal and it shows the practical utility of the game, although it might have been uh, fairer and simpler to just toss a coin in the courtroom. Yeah, <laughs> I think it would have been slightly, slightly easier, slightly quicker to do. Mm. 
Um, the second, um, not a court case, but important decision that's been documented as being decided through rock, paper, scissors that I wanted to uh, mention um, is uh, an incident one year prior to this, in 2005, when the CEO of a Japanese television equipment manufacturer decided to auction off um, a collection of impressionist paintings owned by the corporation, um, including at least uh, one piece, uh, Cézanne's large trees under the uh, Jardin de Buffon, which was worth about 14 million US dollars. And he wasn't sure which auction house to um, hire to undertake the uh, commissioning. And so the CEO asked, narrowed the list down to two, and then asked them both to write proposals to explain how each would maximize proceedings and profits from uh, auctioning off this collection of Impressionist paintings. And the houses uh, were then asked, uh, uh, read both the proposals and didn't want to split the collection up into separate auctions, and so asked both firms to decide between themselves who would hold the auction. And they were unable to reach a decision. <laughs> Quite predictably, I might add, I mean, if it's an all or nothing, <laughs> question. Obviously you want to, 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 to be the one that uh, takes those commissions. And so the Japanese CEO told the firms to play rock, paper, scissors to decide who would get the rights to the auction. And quite hilariously, um, one of the auction houses consulted with the 11 year old twin daughters of the international director of their impressionist and modern art department. And the uh, daughters suggested scissors because, quote, everybody expects you to choose rock. So they were clearly onto something. Um, and the other auction house said that they treated it essentially as a game of chance with no particular strategy and arbitrarily decided with paper. And so the first auction house. Uh, having consulted the 11-year-old twin daughters, won the match, sold the $20 million collection, and in the process earned millions of dollars uh, commission for the auction house. So you never know when being able to win a game of rock, paper, scissors will earn you quite a lot of money. Wow. Well, you also never know when you'll have to beat a chimpanzee at a game of rock, paper, scissors, because believe it or not, chimps can learn to play rock, paper, scissors. And if you want to learn more about it, there is a BBC News article with a 45 second video about it. <laughs> um, there was a case of rock, paper, scissors being used in women's football in 2018. Mm hmm. Uh, again, as a substitute for a, a coin toss, really, that could have been done instead. But this happened because the referee did not have a coin toss present to determine which team gets to kick off. So the ref just made them play rock, paper, scissors. <laughs> and, <laughs> and for that, they were subsequently suspended for three weeks because you're not supposed to do that. What? But I mean, it worked. I I somehow overlooked. It's it's a very small paragraph in the article, and I somehow must have overlooked this when I was reading it. I did not know that, and that is amazing. <laughs> Firstly, <laughs> how hard is it to get a coin? And secondly, why it, that's worth a three week suspension? That's amazing. Uh, do they use a special coin, perhaps that's perfectly balanced, or? Can a, can a referee just use any old loose change lying around in their pocket? I have no idea. Although, hovering... I, no clue, mate. <laughs> I can't answer that one. <laughs> Although, I guess this uh, the source is an article from 2018, and that's dangerously close to the who even uses cash anymore phase of society that we've reached. So, mm. I... Um, maybe yeah, I think it's perfectly it's, legitimate to not have a coin on you at any given time it's also good to practice rock paper scissors 
given that you don't want to be outplayed by a chimp. Yes. And that they were taught in 2017, so... Yes. And, of course, it's not just um, through human intervention that rock, paper, scissors style um, games or decision-making processes appear in nature, right? Um, there's a um, <clears throat> mating strategy of the common side-blotched lizard, um, which is a species native to uh, North Mexico and the western United States desert areas, um, <clears throat> which is notable for having a unique form of polymorphism, wherein each of the three different male morphs has uh, a different uh, coloured throat, either orange, blue or yellow, and it appears that in mating competitions for female lizards, um, invariably, orange lizards beat blue lizards, blue-throated lizards beat yellow-throated lizards, and yellow-throated lizards beat orange-throated lizards. So it's um, uh, it, it's it's nature's equivalent of rock paper scissors is actually orange blue yellow. <laughs> Very bizarre. Well, bacteria not just lizards are seen to exhibit some sort of similar dynamic so i believe that the case here is that so some bacteria produce their own antibiotics and they do this to compete with other bacteria but what you can end up with is a pattern of sort of continuous competition so you will have some bacteria that produce antibiotics and some bacteria that are sensitive to them and die mm -hmm. but then you will have some bacteria that are resistant to these antibiotic producers and then subsequently outcompete the producers. But then that lets the antibiotic sensitive bacteria multiply and outcompete the others until the antibiotic producers multiply again. So it's a bit of a life cycle. <laughs> a, a rock, paper, scissors style life cycle. And uh, it's a relatively general evolutionary model it states so it might not just be restricted to these bacteria it's it's actually fascinating how a, a a human game when you strip away the elements of culture and the labels and and reduce it to its mathematical uh, or axiomatic fundamental components can then be found all over the place in nature when you go looking um, in a way I think it's a reminder that we are part of nature as well if I wanted to get particularly philosophical about it um, Deep. I have a question for you though coming back to human culture for a second <laughs> if I told you that there were not one but three films called rock paper scissors and I also told you that they were all the same genre. They're not uh, related to each other, either by uh, production or, um, uh, or, or you know, storyline or anything like that. They just are coincidentally all called rock, paper, scissors. But they are all the same genre of film. What genre do you think a film called rock, paper, scissors of, uh, of film would be? Genre. genre. So, I'm not sure about the genre, but I would expect that they have a very unique rating system compared to other films, you know? Like, I wouldn't be surprised if the first film is better than the second, and the second's better than the third, but the third is somehow better than the first. <laughs> um, yeah, but aside from that lame joke, I have no idea. Well, the answer is they are all thrillers. The first one 
It was released in 2012. To be fair, it was a uh, Spanish, well, actually, it's a, it's a Venezuelan, so Spanish language uh, film. Um, the Disambiguation page, which sent me to it, describes it as a thriller, although to be fair, on the film page itself, it's actually described as a horror drama, so maybe that's a little bit suspicious, um, but it's called Rock, Paper, Scissors. Then in 2013, there was a French-Canadian thriller film, um, which again was natively titled the French, um, Roche, Papier, Ciseau, um, but translates as Rock, Paper, Scissors. And then in 2017, there was an American psychological thriller film directed by Tom Holland. Not the Tom Holland you're thinking of, but Thomas Lee Holland, the screenwriter, actor, and director best known for his work in the horror film genre, penning the 1983 sequel to the classic Alfred Hitchcock film Psycho, for example. Uh, nevertheless, this was also known as Rock, Paper, Dead in some... I don't know, some releases, some countries, some cinemas, uh, but officially it's called Rock, Paper, Scissors. Um, so they're all reasonably unknown, I would say, uh, films, but they're all in the thriller, horror genre. The first one, the Venezuelan one, is rated a pretty solid 7.0 out of 10 on IMDb, I must say. Um, the second one, the French-Canadian one, 2013, is rated uh, 6.1 out of 10. So yeah, uh, uh, Venezuelan beats French. And the American one is rated a uh, an underwhelming 4.2 out of 10. So uh, Venezuelan beats French-Canadian, French-Canadian beats American, and we just need to find a reason for the American film to be better than the Venezuelan one, and then we've Well, completed. I know one, you know, like, would you rather watch a not especially good thriller or a thriller that's so bad it's funny, you know? Maybe, maybe there's something to it. <laughs> Although I'd have to watch them to justify that, of course. Yes, we'll have to, we'll have to see. Um... But have you seen many films inspired by games? It seems to be seems to be a fairly common thing, you know. I mean, I don't know how many of those films have a plot that uh, rock paper scissors is particularly important to. But in terms of games in general, we've obviously got a film based upon battleships. I've seen a film based upon the game Tag. <laughs> Really? Have you seen anything like that interesting? Um, I completely forgot. What was that film called? Based on, or named after Battleship. Was it called? I, I, I know the it film It was now. just called Battleship. Just called Battleship. I remember seeing it. Was it? That, one, that was, was it 2012? Battleship. It was 2012. Yeah, 2012. That, I, can, I, had, I had completely forgotten that that film existed. I saw it in the cinema. Wow. <laughs> You're right. I don't know what other what other films are named after games. If we broaden it away from uh, physical uh, or board games yeah, and add it to games. video games, then we've got quite a, a selection to choose from, right? But video game films are notoriously meh, aren't they? In general, yeah, they're. Well, I'd say notoriously bad, but there are obviously some exceptions that are pretty decent. I mean, uh, have you seen have you seen the Tomb Raider movie? I haven't. Is it good? I liked it. Let's see how it's rated <laughs> before I before I go giving too many recommendations. Um. Uh, hmm. Is this the right one? This is the right one. Mm -hmm. Well, it's got a 6.3 out of 10 on IMDb, but I'm not going to lie, I'm, I've grown less dependent on IMDb, less trusting of their rating system, because I'll be honest, I was watching a TV show the other day, 
and one of the episodes with without being specific although i can tell you if you're too curious it was kind of it was kind of trash there was an episode that was really really boring kind of lo- kind of drawn out nothing really happened but it was full of exposition and i guess fan service law dropping mm-hmm. and there were some episodes before and after it where there was a little bit of action a little bit of drama and I found those episodes were way more entertaining uh, and so I went and checked because I was interested how much does fan service get you in terms of reviews and unfortunately for me the, the really boring episode had over 9 out of 10 on IMDb but I'm telling you, I promise you, it's a boring episode. I promise. <laughs> and the other episodes were much lower, like uh, below eight. So I don't trust IMDb anymore because anyone can rate on it. Well, that's. <laughs> I mean, but, but, but that's so for certain things. So for certain things with niche communities, you're not going to have a sample that represents the general population. That's true. And I also, incidentally, have just found the uh, best answer to your original question about game uh, films based on games, and the answer is chess. Chess has at least 18 films uh, premised on, you know, chess um, playing, teaching chess, chess grandmasters, that sort of thing. Um, in fact, IMDb has a list of excellent uh, chess films and the top five are Queen to Play 2009, um, The Dark Horse 2014, uh, Queen of Cartway 2016, uh, Searching for Bobby Fischer, it's quite a famous one, 1993, Mm -hmm. and then of course that you might have seen on Netflix advertised quite heavily, The Queen's Gambit, released in 2020. So uh chess i think might take the top spot uh, and i admit i've i myself uh, recently have uh, gotten into chess um uh, i'm not going to say seriously nothing like that but um uh, i i played a few casual games and became interested in actually what strategy is involved in it and i went down an enormous rabbit hole and my youtube recommendations is now chock full of <laughs> chess videos and I can't get I out had, I will say I, I dabbled in the past but yeah again never that seriously it was more of a sixth form uh, free period pastime but it doesn't really surprise me that chess has so many movies not just because it's a very well known game but it has some quite interesting history, especially in terms of a relationship between the USA and the USSR during the Cold War. It was a little little bit of a way of playing out some hostilities in a game, in a game form, because the USSR was very good at chess. Yes, you had... Um... Oh, uh, what's his name? Is it uh, Gary Kasparov? I want to say, is that his name? His surname is Kasparov. Certainly, the there is a Gary Kasparov. Yes, the grandmaster who fought the uh, the the battle for humanity, the chess battle for humanity against Deep Blue in the I'm not sure when. Um, let me check Kasparov versus Deep Blue. Uh, he fought in. 1996 and 1997 yes he uh, played two uh, matches uh, in the first one he played in 1996 and he actually he won four games to two um, but even the fact that deep blue won two of those games it was pretty scary and then the following year uh, in new york city uh, deep blue won three and a half to two and a half i don't know enough about chess to explain how you can win half a game of chess 
but the point is deep blue. Would that maybe be a, a draw that they've just given half a win to each side? I don't know. Ah, maybe. Ah, that yes, very very possibly. <laughs> but in any case, three point five to two point five, and yeah, that was the that was the moment that machines eclipsed the best humans, and currently the reigning chess champion is a Norwegian man called Magnus Carlsen whose ELO rating which is the uh, the the way of measuring the, the, the general skill of a, of a chess player is I think in the high 2000s 2800, 2900, something like that and the um, modern chess engines are about a thousand ahead of even him so the, the gap has only widened since then <laughs> Um, mm. But uh, well, we're we're going on quite a tangent about chess. We are actually. Uh, I can I can continue it though. <laughs> I mean, there is, I've got more thoughts. <laughs> I was going to say. Uh, I think that the thing about chess is there's sort of like uh, two two elements to it that make you quite good, and those elements are uh, one is being able to think ahead of course like what will happen when I make this move what moves could they make what moves could I make after that mm -hmm. but actually that's pretty limited because with so many pieces on a board there's an immense amount of combinations that can occur in only a few turns especially from the beginning of the game mm. so that is actually something that even human chess players um, at very high levels are limited. They're, they're never going to be able to plan more than like a few turns ahead. Mm. But the other thing that allows players to be so strong is having a memory from having seen positions before and experienced how they've played out. So when you do get into a situation where you're planning moves ahead and you're thinking, what will the board position be, it, depending on how my opponent responds, having an idea of whether a board position looks good for you or not, based purely upon having seen a game in the past play out, even if you don't have to keep simulating more moves ahead, that's pretty helpful. But as I said, there's a pretty hard limit on how far humans can plan ahead and for machines well they can go quite a bit further hmm. let's um uh let us i think now leave the world of chess although it's a brilliant game and return briefly to conclude with with hand games if anyone wants to decide a trivial or indeed not, as we've heard, matter in the future, but feels that rock, paper, scissors is somehow biased, or people may know the strategies, or they just want to try something new, I suggest the similar hand game of uh, uh, Mora, M-O-R-R-A. I'm not sure exactly how it's pronounced, Mora. And this is a, a hand game that dates back <clears throat> to ancient Rome and ancient Greece and each player it can be played between any number of people simultaneously because the way it's played is that each player starts with a fist as in rock paper scissors and then on the signal reveals their palm and any number of fingers and declares a number and any player who successfully guesses the total number of fingers revealed by all players combined scores one point and so if it's just between two people then you can play just one round um, unless you of course both guess identically um, uh, or you can keep going and play uh, as many rounds as, as you want um, and it's it's still played um, it's still played today in some circles it's not a dead game the the little brother uh, the, 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 West, the ancient Western world's answer to rock, paper, scissors is Mara. So maybe uh, give that a go at some point. Yeah, we should. Everyone should give it a go.